seven-year itch. Join us in welcoming Vanessa Brown. And now, here's your man of the half hour, Skippy Lowe. Vanessa Brown. Hi, Skip. Hi. Quiz Kid. The original Quiz Kid. I mean, come on. Yeah. On radio? On radio. Now, out of Chicago. In Chicago, Illinois? Well, I was in a play called Watch on the Rhine. Right. And they came backstage and they said to the general manager, who do you think would do best? Uh -huh. Because Skippy Homeyer had done it. Yes. And it turned out okay that Tomorrow the World had played Chicago. Right. So they decided they might as well go with another child actor. Uh -huh. you know? And there were six of us in the show. There was uh -huh. Anne Blythe. I understudied Anne. And there were two boys and two understudy boys. And the manager said that I would do the best. And uh -huh. so that's how I got on the show the first time. And I turned out okay, so they scored me. They scored you. Yeah. God. First, Vienna. Born in Vienna. Right. Paris. Yeah. Came to America as a young girl. Yes. I had my 10th birthday in New York City. Uh-huh. Show. First show. First show was Watch on the Rhine. Watch. Was that the first? Yes. The very, very first. Well, no. Let's see. See, I became, I went to a very nice junior high school, Joan of Arc Junior High School, 118. And out of that, I was picked to be a young reviewer. Uh-huh. And that was the junior board of the National Board of Review of Motion Pictures. Uh-huh. And we, we got to meet people like Walt Disney who would come in to talk to us, uh -huh. you know. I was so amazed. Here's Walt Disney, and he's coming to talk to 11-year-olds. Uh -huh. But he was interested. And then I interviewed him later. Uh -huh. That's the interesting thing. Well, anyway, the young reviewers had a radio program. Right. And it was a called Children Also Are People. It was on CBS radio. And they picked me and three boys right. to be really children. I mean... The, uh -huh. You know, in other words, children are all, right. also people. There was a lot of adults talking, but, I mean, they also picked us. And so there was a lot of publicity out of that. Uh -huh. So basically, I did one television show for W, the, the NBC Pioneer Station, right. television station, and I did that radio program for CBS Radio. Right. And then I went into Watch on the Rhine. Who was on that show? Do you remember? Paul Lucas, uh -huh. Lucille Watson. Mady Christians, John Lodge, oh. who was the brother of uh, the yes. the, uh, the guy who was at the UN, and very famous Boston family, and uh, George Kalouris uh -huh. played the villain. Helen, I'm not sure whether her name was Dodge or not, but she uh -huh. played like the secondary love interest. And then there were three children and three understudy children. Uh -huh. And we had a wonderful stage manager named Felix Jacobis. Uh -huh. And Herman Shumlin produced and directed the show. Uh -huh. It was a play written by Lillian Hellman. It won the Pulitzer Prize. Really? It was great, yes. Yeah. And we did two tours, two national tours. Uh -huh. Then you came to Hollywood. Yes. yes? Uh, David O. Selznick saw a performance in New York. Uh -huh. And because my agent was Paul Kohner, he had me take some stills. I think one of those we sent to you. Right. The, the head shots with the braid where it made me look like Bergman. Uh-huh. Go ahead. Well, that was taken by Maureen. She was a photographer and uh -huh. uh, Kohner showed those to Selznick and I guess either before or after David had seen the, the show, the one performance that I played in right. when Anne got sick. And he signed me, but it was a conditional thing. You'd have to come to Hollywood before the money started. Uh -huh. But I had Quiz Kids to go back to, so my mother and I traveled to Chicago, and I did two Quiz Kids shows. Right. And they give you a $50 bond, uh -huh. and so that paid for the rest of the trip to California. And when I came out here, David O. Selznick paid me. In other right. words, when I got here. And I got $125, uh -huh. and I was under contract Con to David O. Selznick. Selznick at 20th. No, at, at, uh, at, at which is now the Laird Laird Studio, Laird, which, right. is, which is then Selznick Instant International. But you did a lot of films at 20th, though. But that was later. Later? In, an, in 1945 to 47, right. I was under contract. At 20th. Yes. Because you did pictures with Betty Grable, Mother yeah. Wore Tights. Yeah, that was a wonderful. I mean, that was a very good picture. I love oh. that Betty Grable on the set. The thing is wonderful. First of all, I liked her very much. Betty Grable? One of the w nicest people, nicest, uh -huh. most down-to-earth, uh -huh. levelest people. I mean, I remember asking her, what are you going to do when you can't dance anymore? Right. She said to me, I will not go on at all after that. In other words, this is what I do, do best. best, this is what I'm good at, uh -huh. and then I will quit. Uh -huh. Mrs. You work Jean Turney, one of my favorite films, yeah. with Rex Harrison and Jean Turney yeah. and Mrs. The Ghost and Mrs. Muir. The Ghost of Mrs. Muir. Tell me yeah. about that. You were very young in that film. 
I was about 17. 17? Mm -hmm. Tell me about that movie, working with this great lady. I love well, her. Well, the thing is, uh, Jean was beautiful, and she was a very, very fine actress, and she had done a picture for Joe Mankiewicz before. Right. Joe Mankiewicz was the director on the film, and uh, I had done a film for him before called The Late George Apley. Right. So, um, I mean, I'll tell you a very funny story, which is... Not, <laughs> not, ter Love not terribly it. tactful That's okay. of me. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, we did retakes on the late George Apley when Joe was in New York. Right. And I had been a great favorite of Joe's. We got along very well. I knew the family. I knew Sarah and Herman Mankiewicz, and I knew Frank at school at UCLA. Anyway, we would have long conversations. And I guess... Um, Adele must have been a little jealous, the executive secretary. Right. Uh, anytime you get close to somebody, you know, who's considered a big man, then there's a lot of people saying, my God, you yes, know. Yes, yes. I mean, they, so anyway, I did it out of a joke. We did retakes with Ernest Lubitsch. Lubitsch uh -huh. did the retakes because Peggy Cummings was a favorite of Zanuck, and so we got retakes. Peggy and Cummings is the English actress. Yes, but she played the, the other part in the late George mm -hmm. Apley. Right. So they rewrote a scene for her and me mm -hmm. where she gives me advice, and I go in this dowdy wedding dress, and she says to me, now you go to, the, to New York uh -huh. and get uh, Uncle uh, you know, Ronald Coleman yeah. to buy you a good outfit so you look good, you know? Uh -huh. Never mind this, this old stuff. Right. Anyway, we go into the dressing room before the take, and there's the great Mr. Lubitsch, and he says something very flattering to me. You know, there's a thinking actress. And uh, I was so happy that for the first time, after all these years, it was, a, it was considered a plus to be a thinking actress, uh -huh. you know? <laughs> I mean, it, you don't know what I went through before then. Because it, at that time, if you had any kind of intelligence, you had to hide it below a uh, low bosom, <laughs> or you were not considered sexy. Uh -huh. And that cost you jobs right. if you were not considered sexy. So anyway, um, I was so happy with this compliment of Mr. Lubitsch's that I waltzed myself into Joe's office, and Joe was in New York, and I said to <laughs> Adele, I just forgot everything. And I said, now, Lubitsch, there's a director for you. <laughs> well, uh -huh. the next thing I know, they are testing June Lockhart for my part in The Ghost and Mrs. Well, Muir. Oh, no. So I figured I did something wrong. Uh -huh. What did I do wrong? <laughs> and I figured it out. So I went to visit Joe on the set of The Ghost and Mrs. Muir. Joe was delighted to see me. God knows what Adele had told him. <laughs> and he walked me to the door, and I was back in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Isn't that awful? That's great. It's Lana awful. Turner. The Bad and the Beautiful. What a great movie. Lana. I only know stories about Lana. I did not work with her. I worked with Kirk Douglas, uh -huh. and I worked with uh, Barry Sullivan. And so and you I did your scenes with Kirk Douglas. Yes. In other words, this, the picture is more or less divided right. into three parts. Right. The way I got the film is interesting because it shows you the influence of television upon the movies. Uh -huh. Now, John Houseman was a very good friend of the Mankiewicz's, so I would see him frequently, right. you know. But never in business uh, context. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't get in the door at Metro to see even the second most important casting man. So I went to New York, took a lot of stuff with me, and decided to do you know a lot of live television right. and interviews and stuff, and just stay alive. So I did the show of shows, the Max Liebman thing. Of course. Song and dance, yes, right. you know, with Carl uh -huh. Reiner and, and Howie Morris. And the next day, yeah. My agent calls up, Houseman and Manelli want you. Is this sufficient <laughs> money? I mean, I not only didn't have to go through the, uh -huh. the office, you know, uh -huh. but they were asking me if it was sufficient money. Uh -huh. So I said, it's sufficient money. I have only one problem. I have too much luggage with me, uh -huh. and it'll be too expensive to go. You know, not, they were wanting me to go back first class. Right. And I had come in tourist. Uh -huh. And I thought maybe of packing everything up and sending it parcel post. So <laughs> I had this friend of mine at, uh, in the marketing department at Metro, uh -huh. very nice friend. And I called him up and I said, Dan, do you know a cheap way to send stuff across the country 
And he said, let's go back on this one, Vanessa. Let, let me hear this one again. <laughs> and he said, don't be ridiculous. After what they did to you, we'll hire two front seats <laughs> and we'll get all your junk back. <laughs> I love it. Voice of the radio. I mean, you. I mean, let's fa let's face voice it. Voice of America. You, America. Voice of America. Yeah, you. That been, was I the mean, best thing. That voice, really. You know, your voice has been all over that radio constantly. Voice yeah. of America. Tell me about that. I used to have a sheep ranger in Australia write me regularly. Uh -huh. Could I have had a chance to visit him? Right. I didn't, you didn't. follow up on that. You didn't follow up. No. <laughs> However, uh, the Voice of America. I was practically the bureau chief here from 62 to 82. Right. Just about. I mean, the Munich desk came in, Ed Gordon, right. and took over, and then they opened up the formal office. So in, in effect, it ran out of my house for a long uh -huh. time. But Murrow hired me, Edward R. Murrow, uh -huh. and I outlasted Murrow, Carl Rowan, and Mr. Chancellor. Uh -huh. And I did some wonderful work, and Look. we're using that as a uh -huh. basis for uh -huh. what do you want to be tomorrow. We were using yes, those audio yes. tapes. Vanessa, looking back over your career, I mean, when you were a child, you even wanted to be a you, journalist ever since. Mm -hmm. Not an actress, but a journalist. I think I was that much more oriented towards uh, political history and uh, because of my father's influence on me. Oh, really? Well, he taught me from the age of three on. Uh -huh. I mean, he had come from Russia in 1917. His mother had given him a boat, uh -huh. and the revolution was on, and she said, go, my son. Uh -huh. And he took this canoe and he went down the river and the border there was open. Right. So he walked across four countries and uh -huh. he got to Vienna and eventually met my mother in Vienna. So what I'm saying to you is I'm really a product of the historical forces right. that were happening in 1928 when I was born. Uh -huh. And in, when I was going to kindergarten, my father would draw the sled. Uh -huh. And he, they'd take me to this Montessori kindergarten. I had a very good education early. Right. And um, my mother was a psychologist, and she was a student of Alfred Adler. And my father was a linguist and right. a writer. And uh, my father's first, you know, he was always teaching me things, always taking time, took a lot of time to show me the different parts of the cities that we lived in. Right. And uh, there was a... Um, there was an electrical strike at right. the time. It was Shushnik, who was, I think, a socialist. I'm not sure. But anyway, Shushnik was the prime minister of Austria. Right. And there was an electrical workers' strike, so they had to pick me up from kindergarten early uh -huh. because I couldn't stay there. Right. Because it was dark mm -hmm. in the winter. So I missed the kindergarten. That was the fun part. It was a uh -huh. wonderful thing. You learned with compasses and you learned with colors. And uh -huh. The fun place. So I asked, said, why did we have to leave? And then there was a week that we didn't go to there. Right. So he said, he explained it to me. And uh -huh. he explained it in terms that I'll never forget. Uh -huh. And he said, because we later on, when we got, went back, there were whole bullet holes in the bathrooms. Right. You know, we, this was in a workers, uh, you know, low-income housing right. development, and the bells were hanging like this. There'd uh -huh. been a shootout. Right. So that's why the kindergarten was closed. Uh -huh. So he explained in terms that I remember to this day and that I understood, and it was like my biggest lesson. He said, if the railroad workers had stuck with the electrical workers, right. the government would not have been able to bring troops in on the railroads. Uh -huh and shoot up the electrical workers. Uh -huh. And the moral was, if people don't stick together, they die separately. <laughs> and that's that a, is a yes, wonderful, wonderful lesson, lesson yes. to learn. That well, early. Uh, Vanessa, I mean, you came to Hollywood, you became a wonderful actress, a thinking actress, let's see, a <laughs> thinking actress, right? Yeah. But look at this picture. I gotta show my audience, look. Wagon this, train. What, is this from Wagon Train? Wagon Train, NBC, I think. NBC? Is yeah. This? What is this from? This was a still by John Engstead. He shot me over the years. He Look was it. a very fine still photographer. And that was used for the, sh the, the sheet music Vanessa uh -huh. by Bernie Wayne. Right. And that was used for the fighter. Uh -huh. Remember the fighter? Yes, of course, the fighter. There, you are on Life magazine on the cover. Look at Vanessa Brown. That uh was during the seven year itch days. And that's Philippe Holtzman uh -huh. is the photographer. Uh -huh. You originated the seven year itch on Broadway, Right. right? Yes, Marilyn me, played my part later. And Marilyn Monroe played it in the film later. Mm -hmm. Tell me about 
on Broadway, the Seven Year Itch. What kind of reaction was that show on Broadway at that time? That's uh, we made. We had a huge hit. In other words, when we were playing New Haven, Tommy Ewell said to me, "Sweetie, we have a hit." I uh -huh. said, "How do you know?" He says, "I know." Uh huh. And then you know, I was it for the girl uh -huh. was it, and uh -huh. I was it for two years. Sir, Vanessa Brown. This is my favorite picture. This really? is this is Vanessa Brown. Like yeah. I think of Vanessa Brown. Really, that was Warner why? Brothers. Why? Yes, but why? Contract. Why do I think of Vanessa Brown in this picture than any other picture? I don't know. What? Where is this from? Just that was taken at the Warner Brothers Steel Photography, but the jacket my mother made. Uh huh. I mean, it's a hand-sewn jacket. This is what I, this is the thinking actress I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is beautiful, Vanessa. This is Oleg Cassini gown, and it's an Engstead picture. Uh huh. Uh huh. It was a shot approximately 1950. Where is it really? Yeah. Oh. Enjoy doing those movies those days because you're yes. such a bright lady. I mean, you know, yes. you've had such great education. You know. Well, uh, I mean, one thing doesn't hurt another. Uh huh. You I mean, the thing was the thing that was hard is Quiz girl, that if you, you know? had to no, if you had to eat, yes, that means you had to work frequently. Uh huh. And Paul Kohner got me wonderful contracts. I mean, first Selznick, and then Warner Brothers, and then the, the uh, Mervyn Leroy, right, and then Fox, and in between there was a picture for Frank Borzaghi. Right. So I mean, I got really top people. Uh huh. But. When you were under contract, the, the inevitably, uh -huh. the producers and directors, like at Warner Brothers, like Michael Curtiz and Henry Blanket, right. they would always hire outside. Right. At Fox, it was a little better. It was more freer. Well, it was a little better because I saw Zanuck very early in the game, and they right. said, "My God, you're seeing Zanuck!" Uh -huh. Woo! And Zanuck promised to make a big star out of me. Well, the next thing they put me into a bit in Margie, what Henry With King Jeannie was doing. With Henry King was yes, the director. Yes, Henry King, the director. So I shouldn't complain, you know right, what I mean? In right. other words, they were, and they groomed you. I mean, they groomed you. First of all, you had the publicity department working overtime to, to make your name right. a, a commodity. Right. And a very nice department run by Harry Brand, and some of the people are still there. Uh -huh. uh, I talked to one of them the other day. And we made good friends. I mean, Gene Peters was my friend. Colleen Townsend was uh -huh. my friend. You know, people that we right. stay, we stay together. Do you still see them? Yes. You still you see your oh, friends? Oh, yeah. Oh, Gene yes. Peters, how is yes. she doing? Now? She's doing very nice. Is she? She's unfortunately lost her husband uh, recently, but, but she's doing Vanessa, very nice. Vanessa, why don't we have the system anymore? Why, is, why, why doesn't well, someone come with the studio system? It's a shame because there was an awful lot going for it. For example, we had dance lessons at Fox. Right. We had um, Fencing, speech lessons. Speech. The thing is, even Marilyn, Marilyn came, came on in the dance class one day, and she was like this, a little Angora sweater with the short shorts. Uh -huh. And she said, can I come in here too? Uh -huh. And I said, if you're under contract, you can come in. I mean, this is for us right. contract players. And then I told her about these free music lessons that were available. She said, free music lessons. Uh -huh. And that's when she went over to the Newmans, Newmans you know, uh -huh. and learned that she could do that. Did you get she, to know her later in the years? After? I saw her every so often. Like I saw her when she was uh, married to Yves Montand, oui. and um, she looked very happy. And I said, "You look very happy." And she said, "So do you." <laughs> was she just carefree, little girl? Well, like at that point, she was she was happy. I tried to go see her mother once. Uh huh. You did. They wouldn't let me. They wouldn't Why let me would see Vanessa her. Brown would like to do that? Why did you do that? I just wanted to find out more about Marilyn's background. Really? I was interested in. I I've always been interested in the people that uh, I worked with, uh -huh. and um, I, f I felt sorry for Marilyn because she was going from man to man. She really was? Well, I mean, marrying uh -huh. them even. I mean, yeah. I don't know anything illicit. Uh -huh. And then uh, I thought her death was tragic, but... Um, <sighs> accident? I don't think she killed herself. You don't think she killed no. herself? I don't so think it so. was an accident? I think that the psychiatrist who treated her is guilty of murder. And really? I've always thought so, and I called them up and told them that. You did? Yeah. And I went down to CBS, and I went down to NBC, because my girlfriend told me, go, help, help her, you know, get her uh -huh. a good obit at least. I the see. thing is, she did not kill herself. I wasn't there. Yes. Yeah. But I, I just don't think so. Marilyn it was not a suicidal type. I see. What happened is, she probably was so distressed, she yes. couldn't sleep. The housekeeper left, mm -hmm. 
and she was alone. And she and forgot how many pills she that's took. That's right, and I, maybe I, she took a sip of her drink. Yeah. You know, just to yeah. fall asleep. Yes, exactly. Just and forget. she called up the last friend, and they'd say, well, listen, Donnie, i got to go to dinner. You know, my wife is, you know, right. whatever. And, and she had no one to talk to. It's a lonely time to be I mean, a that was a very t rough time. Yeah. And what I was bothered with is that she was talented, and she had a lot of ambition and a lot of energy, uh -huh. and I felt the studio was guilty of murder, too, because they used her. Yes. They made a lot of money, an awful lot of people made a lot of money. Well, that's what Hollywood's about, though. Well, I hate to see this, you know, Jimmy Dean and Marilyn, you know, now yes. they're dead, now they're being Everyone's worshipped. Everyone's making money. Now they're it. being worshipped. Yeah. Why is that? Why is it? Because of money? Someone out there trying to make money on that? Well, obviously, somebody's selling the photographs, somebody's selling the books, somebody is, is spinning the yarns, you know. But it feeds <laughs> on something that people need. People need heroes. Uh -huh. People need beautiful people uh -huh. to look up to. People want to believe. Is that what you think Jimmy Dean's so powerful today and, and Marilyn to keep that name alive? And the Somebody's people keeping it alive. I mean, there's obviously somebody that's interested in keeping it alive. I mean, the, the Presley thing didn't start by itself. Presley, yeah. I mean, there was a manager there who was interested. Right. And there are people that are benefiting from the sale of the records and, and the, the memorabilia and all yes, of that. Yes, There's always some member of the family, like the Edward, the, the Tarzan people. Yes. The, Mr. Mr. Burroughs uh, died broke. But now there is a Tarzana, and there is a whole foundation yes. uh, run by the nephew, uh -huh. and they have these conventions. I don't see Clark Gable so big today. What he well, was who one does of he have? Mrs. Spreckles? Yeah. I mean, I mean, who does he have pushing him? Nobody pushes no him. No pushes Clark Gable. Well, if no one pushes him, then he's, not, then he's, he's forgotten. He was, Mr. he was Mr. Movies, don't you wonderful, think? Wonderful, wonderful actor. Yeah. Wonderful. Stanley Kramer. Love I worked him. with him. Love him. Yes, did a him. movie. Yeah, I did Bless the Beasts and the Children, and uh, I interviewed him for The Voice of America, a great filmmaker. And uh, I understand he has a daughter in the business. Right. I interviewed her, huh? Yeah. Catherine. And she And I saw her. Singing. No, I didn't see her singing. I mean, I saw her uh, on the uh -huh. lot or something. Uh-huh. And she said that her father was preparing a new film. Right. Oh, really? So oh. I didn't know that. I mean, I didn't, I didn't know. I had been told that he was working on the Valenza story, you know, uh -huh. the, uh, s the Polish uh, uh, leader. Leader, yes, yes. But I hadn't heard anything lately, so I, I don't see. know what it is. I know they're back on. in town. They moved back from yeah. Seattle. Mm -hmm. Vanessa Brown, this picture. I mean, is that, this a fashion? Is that, this a that's uh, Philippe Holzman again, and he shot the cover. Uh -huh. And that was the story on Stoles. On and Stoles? that is a funny story. Oh, really? Tell yeah. us the story. Well, um, I'd love to hear it. You see, during the seven year itch, I had already been inside the book for the right. show. And um, when, you're in, when you're the hit of the, of the season, you get invited to the two big balls. Right. One is the March of Dimes at the Waldorf, and the other one is the April in Paris. I think it's also at the Waldorf. Anyway, big, big affairs. Uh -huh. And uh, at the March of Dimes show, I was given some text, you know. Right. And I, I just thought it wasn't appropriate. And so the stage manager is running around, and I said, would you mind if I put this in my own words? And he said, no, honey, go ahead. You know, I mean, he uh -huh. couldn't be bothered. So, Okay, so I had helped design this dress, this thing with uh -huh. on the life cover, you know. With, it was a red strapless, and my daughter has been wearing it. Ah. It's tight pants. Uh -huh. And and then she, uh, Claire Potter, designer, added a 15-foot train, uh -huh. you know, that you drag. Uh -huh. So I came out, and I said, this little outfit designed by Claire Potter, and that was the only designer that got a credit, uh -huh. you know, it is designed specifically for washing dishes. <laughs> Everybody roared. <laughs> then I said, let me show you how practical this is. Uh -huh. You drape yourself in the doorway, and you say, a little more soap, honey. <laughs> the hot water is to the left. And you straighten out, and you straighten it out, and you say, you see how practical this is? And it doesn't even get dirty. <laughs> Cute. Anyway, then I go down the rain, and there's Claire Potter, and she's hugging me. She says, oh, honey, you stole the show. <laughs> anyway, a couple of weeks later, apparently, Sally Kirkland, who uh -huh. is the mother of yes. Sally Kirkland that we know. So we know, of course. She yeah, was the fashion editor. Fashion. fashion editor was next to God right. at Life at, at Life that magazine. point. Right. 
And she calls, she was in Claire Potter's thing, and she says, oh, my God, I've got to do this layout on stoles, and I don't know who to get. And Claire Potter said, the world's authority on stoles is Vanessa Brown. <laughs> so she said, you're right. She calls me up, and she says, Miss Brown, if we could get you your favorite photographer, Philippe Halsman, and we would only take two hours of your time, <laughs> would you mind doing this little layout that we have on stoles? Uh -huh. I said, if I can do the captions, I'll do it. Uh -huh. Fine. So we do the layout. And then the, now, now comes, it's March uh -huh. 1953. I am watching the Middle East. Right. I am sure Mossadegh is going to get killed and I'm going to get bumped off the cover. <laughs> I am watching every newscast. How is everybody that comes in, what's happening in, right. in the place where he's at? And they said, gee, I don't know. You know. And anyway, what happened was Tuesday, Marvin Cohn called me right. and he said, Honey, the <laughs> magazine went to bed. Aha, uh -huh, great. <laughs> what happened was the Russians had withheld the knowledge that Stalin had been dead for three days uh -huh. because the next girl on the next cover got bumped, bumped. for uh -huh. the successors so, to Stalin. Right, right. That's how I made life. I love it. This. This, tell me about this. I oh, love this. Oh, I love the this caption. This movie, tell I me. I love the caption. What's the capture? What no, does it the say? The caption is wonderful. It says, <laughs> I'm not sorry for what I've done. I'd do it again. <laughs> what film is that? This is called Girl of the Limberlost. Ah. It's based on an old, old classic. Right. And this was Mel Ferrer's first directing job, and it was Columbia. And who's this? Who's this right here? Where? This one right here. Let me look. Let me look. Who's that? You know, I have lost you, touch with him. You really? That's Dorinda Clifton. Right. And I haven't seen her either. Ah. Oh, I love some this. Some people you keep in touch with and some people you lose track of. Vanessa Brown, look at this. Where is this? That's Milton uh, Green, who became Maryland's uh, vice president. Uh -huh. Remember? We did this layout before the seven-year itch uh -huh. in his studio in, in New York. Ah, oh, great. Looking back over your career, you're happy? Yeah. Are you? Yeah. Would you do it the same way, Vanessa? I don't know that you, you can't second guess yourself. You know, you, you make decisions from time to time, and they're the valid ones. And but you seem to have a, you would say you had a good time in your life so far. I, I always have a good time. I mean, even in misery, I have a good time. I don't know what you mean by that. Tell me I mean, you, mean. Uh, you, you can have a choice. You have a choice. You can be miserable or you can be happy. So you take it either way. Well, you have to take it positively. I, I see. So uh, Vanessa Brown is a positive thinker then. That's right. You keep yourself positive. You That's keep yourself busy. Very busy. You have something new coming out. What is it? We're doing a program called What Do You Want to Be Tomorrow, ah. which has been about 11 years in the works. Uh -huh. It was an outgrowth of the need expressed by my children. What am I going to do in life, Mom? Interesting. So I went over to the school, the, the uh, uni, uni High School, uh -huh. and talked to the career guidance person, Linnea Reams, and she said to me, Mrs. Sandridge, the best I can do is I have the Ford dealer of West Los Angeles take 11 kids to lunch. Uh -huh. And I looked at her, and she looked at me, and I said, in West Los Angeles, uh -huh. the best that people can aspire to is to be a Ford dealer?